Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. What's up, McJibbers there? McJibbin here, back with another video. Smash that like button. I can't do it. Can't do it. Can't. Hi, guys. Uh, my name's Connor. I like to learn. Um, preemptive like. History hit. Awesome channel. Pre oh, def def nah. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Click on it, send you right over there. Would love to have you. My name's Connor. I, th I think I said that. I always forget. Let's go. Phone's away. Napoleon, a time to lear learn. And let's do it, you Brits, or everyone. Shouldn't just assume because it's a British plane. Okay. Spitfire. Supermarine Spitfire, most effective World War II fighter aircraft. I thought that the Japanese, before, you know, they resulted to, to um, you know, suicide bomb planes, that, that their main plane in the war was extremely good. But uh, maybe this one was better. Let's, excuse me, I burped. Let's get started. And you can't even see. For as long as I can remember, I've always been in awe of the Spitfire. Especially after hearing tales from my great uncle, who joined the RAF and would reminisce about his experience flying in them. My great uncle stormed the beach. He died storming the beaches of Normandy. But why has the Spitfire remained arguably the most celebrated symbol of the country's spirited resistance during the Second World War? I'm Luke Tomes, and in this video, I'm at the Battle of Britain Air Show in Duxford to learn more about the battle that cemented the Spitfire's place in history. The Spitfire sort of endured for the rest of the war because it became the RAF's main fighter. They were the, the newer and more cutting edge fighter. The pilots who flew in them during the Second World War. I cannot believe they wore this much stuff. And why it occupies such a special place in British hearts to this day. You mix the sight and the sound together, and people just adore Spitfires. Anyone know how cold it gets at like 10,000 feet compared to 20,000 or 30,000? Like, does, does it get, like, Antarctic winter cold or just, like, you know, below freezing cold? I have OCD. I have to fix this. A direct descendant of a series of float planes competing for the coveted Schneider Trophy in the 1920s, the Supermarine Spitfire was designed by engineer Reginald Mitchell in response to numerous Air Ministry specifications throughout the mid-1930s, calling for a fast and high-performance fighter armed with wing-mounted machine guns. Little did Mitchell know that the aircraft would go on to become one of the most revered icons of British air combat. Now, I've been lucky enough to speak to a few Spitfire pilots in my time. Indeed, a couple of my family members joined the RAF and trained to fly Spitfires during the Second World War. Now, without fail, they all said that there was something truly remarkable and unique about this aircraft, which has remained the darling of the British media ever since it went into battle against the Messerschmitt 109s in the summer of 1940. It was then, in the skies above southern England, that the speedy, agile aircraft played a crucial role in fending off fighter escorts of the German Luftwaffe. But does the Spitfire's performance in the Battle of Britain alone truly warrant its subsequent acclaim? And it looks really cool. I've come to the Imperial War Museum's Duxford Airfield to meet senior curator Adrian Kerrison, who I hoped would give me a better understanding of the pivotal air campaign and an objective view on the Spitfire's performance within it. 
OK, Adrian, let's set the scene. It's the summer of 1940. France has fallen and now Britain is definitely concerned for its safety and the RAF is very important to the protection of the island. How did the fleet of aircraft of the RAF compare to that of Germany's? So in July 1940, which is essentially the first month of the Battle of Britain, uh, the RAF standed about 900 fighters, so that's uh, Spitfires, Hurricanes. What? Sorry, when was the first month? Uh, the RAF in July 1940, which is essentially the first month of the Battle of Britain, uh, the RAF standed about 900 fighters, so that's uh, Spitfires, Hurricanes, Defiance, and a few twin-engine fighters as well. In comparison, the Luftwaffe has about 2,800 aircraft, so okay. on paper it looks like they're heavily outnumbered, but in fact about 1,100 of those uh, Luftwaffe forces are fighters, uh, and the rest, about 1,700, are Bomber. bombers. And obviously bombers yeah. aren't a massive threat to RAF fighters, so um, it's actually a bit more equal than it seems. Got it. And we're here at Duxford Airfield. Talk to me a bit about the positioning of this airfield. Why was this so important and what role did Duxford Well, wouldn't bombers always be escorted by uh, the plane? Talk about the positioning of this airfield. Why was this so important and what role did Duxford play? Yeah, yeah. In the summer of 1940. So Duxford was what was known as a sector station during the Battle of Britain. Um, so RAF Fighter Command essentially divided the country into these geographical groups. And then the groups were then subdivided into sectors. Um, and each sector had a sector station, which was effectively the headquarters of the sector. And it was where all the sector's squadrons were controlled. And I would imagine that the vast majority of German targeted bombing bombing runs in Great Britain would be on the London area because it's extremely populated and it's closest. But they maybe, you know, I feel like because of that, you would push your war manufacturing buildings more in country. And directed into combat sector. And it was where all the sector squadrons were controlled and directed into combat. So uh, Duxford was in 12 group, which was basically covered the East Anglia, the Midlands, yeah. parts of Wales, the industrial north, so a very wide area. But Duxford's sector was also at the very south of 12 group. Um, and it bordered 11 group, which was the area that covered um, Southeast England and London. Yeah, London, yeah, of course. So because it was so close to 12 group, uh, you find that in around September 1940, as the battle is like really heating up, that 11 Group is calling in 12 Group for reinforcements. Duxford was heavily involved in the 15th of September 1940, which uh, a lot of us know as Battle of Britain Day, yeah, when it's commemorated. Um, and this was when 1940 in 12 Group for reinforcements. Duxford was heavily involved in the 15th of September 1940, which uh, a lot of us know as Battle of Britain Day, yeah, when it's commemorated. Um, and this was when the Luftwaffe launched two massive raids on London. Uh, hoping for it to be the final knockout blow of the Battle of Britain. And because all of 11 Group's squadrons were committed uh, to intercepting this raid, uh, 11 Group called in 12 Group to support. Um, and Duxford sent uh, what was known as Botter's Big Wing. So this was a wing of five squadrons. So on, in the morning, this was about 56 aircraft all flying together. And they uh, intercepted some of the raids over London uh, and caused quite a lot of damage to the Luftwaffe. And they were sent out again uh, later in the afternoon when the Luftwaffe launched an even larger raid. Um, and they accounted for about 25% of the Luftwaffe's losses that day. So we'll uh, talk a bit about the aircraft. We've got one behind us shortly. Um, earlier, I saw the operations room. Can you tell me a bit about the different roles? Would you guys, this might sound dumb, but do you think that the, I I've seen a lot of like more ancient history and just, not just antiquity, but it, Middle Ages, um, you know, p do you think it, the, the air for, aircraft are like the cavalry, cavalry of modern day war, or am I just making an insane, stupid, not good comparison? Be the, uh, I just, I just a thought. I don't, I don't know. Find us shortly. Um, they, earlier, I saw they, the operations room. Can you tell me a bit about the different roles and the importance of that room during the Battle of Britain? 
Yeah, so the operations room, which was in the operations block, was uh, probably the most important uh, building in Duxford and on uh, other sector stations. And in the operations room, you had the, the general picture of what was going on in the air. Yeah. So on the, the floor, you would have the map table, and this is where enemy movements are essentially tracked and kept up to date. Uh, above that, you would have what were known as tote boards, and these would give the status of all the squadrons in the sector and at the station. Uh, you'd also have information like weather, and you'd have people uh, triangulating uh, the enemy aircraft and the friendly squadrons so that they could then direct them to be intercepted. Of course, yeah. So around the map table, you would have air women of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and they would be receiving plots from radar stations and observer corps posts and they would be uh, putting these on these little blocks on the table, and that would show you where the enemy formations were, how many aircraft there were in them, and their estimated height as well. So then on the dais up above, you'd have the control staff, and the, the head of that staff was the controller, uh, and he was usually also the station commander, the Duxford station commander. Got it. Sorry, but I just flipped that, and it, uh, sorry. Have the control staff. And the, the head Focus. of that staff was the controller, uh, and he was usually also the station commander, the Duxford station commander. Got it, okay. And he would look at this whole picture of everything that's going on, and he would be the, the key decision maker. So he would see where the enemy formations are, he'd be looking at the weather, he'd be looking at the status of the squadrons, how many aircraft he had available, and then he would direct the squadrons where to go. Well, that's the nerve center. Let's talk about the planes got a Spitfire behind us. Now, am I correct in saying that this aircraft, actually, there were more hurricanes produced? That's right. As opposed to the Spitfires? Well, so in, in the Battle of Britain, uh, if we look across the course of the whole battle... Um... Question, guys, why this symbol? You know how, like, the American ones have the star on it? I guess American planes were not nearly, you know, top-notch planes because I hear, you know, German... Air Force, pretty good. You know, British have great planes. Japanese have great planes. America, just a little bit behind in plane technology, or maybe I'm wrong uh, at the time. But why, why the, it almost looks like a target. Obviously, you got the red, white, blue, you know, British uh, Union Jack colors. But uh, I, I just wonder why they went for this design, like the, the triple circle thing. So in there were more hurricanes no. produced. That's right. As opposed to the Spitfires. Well, so in, in the Battle of Britain, uh, if we look across the course of the whole battle, um, Spitfire squadrons were outnumbered by hurricane squadrons, uh, roughly three to two. So there were about 33 uh, hurricane squadrons in the battle and 19 Spitfire squadrons. Um, hurricanes accounted for more of Luftwaffe losses throughout the battle, so around 55%. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. But Spitfires still accounted for 45% despite they did. having less, less of them. Yeah, yeah. So they were obviously a very important part of uh, uh, Fighter Command's yeah. strength, and they were the, the newer and more cutting-edge fighter, and they had, let's be honest, better performance than the Hurricane. And do you think that's the reason why they remained the most iconic? I don't know why it, the word hurricane made me think of it, but in theory, could a plane take off from a runway without moving at all if there were strong enough winds like in the area? Obviously, it, it would be very dangerous and your plane would probably get flown into whatever, but would it technically work? Like, would you get lift if hurricane power winds were blowing at the plane and it could like turn on its engine, not move and just get swiped up. And then it's just kind of a theoretical question. They were the, the newer and more cutting edge fighter and they had, let's be honest, better performance than the hurricane. And do you think that's the reason why they remain the most iconic aircraft and almost like a symbol of the Battle of Britain? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question because Obviously, we talked about how there were more hurricanes contributing to the battle. Yeah. Um, but the, the Spitfire sort of endured for the rest of the war because it became the RAF's main fighter not long after the battle. And it would have been the main fighter that people in Britain saw for the rest of the war. So yeah. I think that has a, a lot to do with why it sort of became the symbol of the Battle of Britain, even though it should technically be the hurricane. Be both. 
I just realized this guy's American. He's speaking American or American English. <clears throat> what are you doing here, man? I became the symbol. For some reason, I, I, I'm not saying that it's a degrading, it, not worse than experience, but I like when... I'm so... Forget what I said. War, so yeah. I think that has a, a Pay attention. lot to do ah. with why it sort of became the symbol of the Battle of Britain, even though it should technically be the hurricane. They both. So Adrian, we've talked about the planes, we've talked about the uh, uh, nerve centre, the operations room. Talk to me about the pilots. How many trained pilots were there and where did Britain source its, its pilots from? Uh, there were about roughly 3,000 aircrew who took part in the Battle of Britain. Um, and a lot of these would have been pre-war regulars. Uh, a lot of them would have come from sort of auxiliary uh, reserve squadrons as well. Um, and you also had around 500, 600 uh, pilots who were not British. So. You had a lot of uh, Czech and Polish exiles, and then you'd have uh, French pilots contributing from the Commonwealth and even places like the United States. And Adrian, myths about the Battle of Britain, there are quite a few, aren't there? There are, yeah, and I know it's a bit of a controversial thing to say, but probably the biggest myth is that the RAF were very close to defeat during the Battle of Britain, and this isn't really quite true. Um, so. You get people saying that the, the RAF were heavy. Any French pilots, I'd assume, after Dunkirk? Or after the fall of France, with a lot of, you know, soldiers had fled, you know, on boats to Britain, I'm, I'm guessing. You know, at, at Dunkirk. That they, I'm sure they would have been very willing to, to, you know, learn how to pilot and put their lives on the line to try and retake their... This is the Battle of Britain really quite true. Um, so you get people saying that the, the RAF were heavily outnumbered, but we already talked about how um, a huge part of the Luftwaffe's forces were bombers. Um, and the RAF also had this massive advantage over the Luftwaffe in the doubting system. And this is what provided uh, radar information cool. to the RAF. Uh, and this essentially allowed the RAF to know when and where to expect enemy attacks and to essentially uh, preserve its resources that it had. Um, also, the Luftwaffe, uh, they, they never really had a coherent strategy, so they kept changing strategy, and they were relying on faulty intelligence, thinking that they were doing a lot more damage than they were. And, okay. you know, RAF air stations were easily repaired, um, and the RAF were able to produce aircraft continuously throughout the battle, so it wasn't as close run as people really make out. Another myth is that a lot of the uh, RAF uh, pilots were very posh and upper class. Oh yeah, that's a good uh, one. <laughs> but in fact, only around 200 posh. of the air crew had like a public school education. Really? So, now that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. I like that there, one. There were a lot of, you know, working class pilots. And the RAF at the time, because it was one, sort of a newer service, there was a lot more meritocracy. So, yeah. you know, almost anyone could be a fighter pilot. You might Absolutely. not make it to officer, but you can still fly uh, as, a, as a sergeant. I just want to uh, say something. I feel like this is the part of the war where Germany, like the, if Germany was going to win the war, like this is their time to seize. Like the time in between, like b before Barbarossa, Obviously, the, you know, it's it's going to be quite a bit before Americans get attacked and then enter the war in Europe, get attacked at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, and then also then Germany declares war in the U.S. right away. And, and I, you know, Battle of Britain saves Britain, but I feel like it, it also saved the war because if Britain fell, then how in the heck is America, even if it wants to take down Germany and Europe, going to make a landing without the what was essentially a giant aircraft carrier of the British Isles. If that had been taken over, I mean, there, I feel like it's, it's pretty much game over. And as the war went on further and more people like the, the U.S. came in and, and Germany had its oil issues and they were very much invested in the Eastern Front, I, I think this was the time where alternate history really could have been, a, you know, Germany won. I could be completely wrong, you know, let me know if you think I am. But uh, yeah, Battle of Britain, but also kind of battle for the war, if 
you disagree, let me know. Well then, if it really was true that almost anyone could become a fighter pilot, I thought I'd get started and familiarize myself with the gear. The clothing and equipment wasn't just designed for the rigors of battle. It was pretty stylish too. I'm not sure if Barbarossa was commencing at this point we're talking about. I, I, I forget. I think it might have been a bit later. A little... I don't know. Hi, Jamie. Hello. How are you doing? Lovely to meet you. Good to see you. So you're part of the uh, number 19 squadron? That's right. We're Spirit of Britain portraying 19 squadron pilots yep. flying from Duxford in the summer and autumn of 1940. Of course, so these are one of the most famous squadrons from the Battle of Britain, aren't they? Indeed, indeed. And here we have some of the gear, don't we? So this right here, life jacket. Yep, nicknamed the May West, 1932 pattern. Uh, yep, life jacket, sure. Yeah, uh, got very... the whistle as well to blow it up, I guess. Uh, we've got Irving flying jacket, another yep. classic piece of um, flying oh, clothing from I the Second one. World War. Fantastic. B-type flying helmet, Mark II goggles, and the D-type oxygen mask. Oxygen mask, okay. Do you think you can purchase one of those? Like, original used jacket. 36 pattern flying boots, keep your feet warm. Fantastic. This screwed up here, that's called a prestige suit. Popular in the pre-war period and in the early part of the Second World War. Quite common to see in the Battle of Britain. It's the same as what I'm wearing here, but in got black. Uh, just cotton, you know. We've got scarf. Scarf, okay. No pilot could be seen without his scarf. They're, uh, again, pretty ubiquitous items. Why, why do they have to wear the scarves? Well, I think it was a, more of a style Just thing a sometimes. Some okay. people say it's, it's to do with the neck and looking around. Oh, okay. But, um, you know, the guys had style, yep. you know. They were proud of who they were and they Absolutely. dressed the part. I can, I can imagine. And here, this is a life jacket, but you said... Another life jacket, but yeah. this one has been doped. Got it. Um, okay. So if you see a Spitfire today, one of the Battle of Britain ones, the roundel on the side has a ring of yellow paint, which is dope. And the guys painted them, so they would have started like this, but you can't see that in the sea. Got so it. they painted them. Um, lots of pictures of 19 squadrons so painted, both front and also the rear. Got the die marker pack, this you pull, and it lets uh, die out into the sea to again try and mark your location so you can be picked up by air sea rescue. Clever. Uh, we've got another B flying helmet, the same as one we've looked at. Yeah. Uh, lots more things to show you, but how about you get into some clothes and we'll try it on for size and see how... Never heard of the dye thing before. That's, that is clever. How you feel? Let's do it. Start with the Irving. <laughs> oh, and gosh. we'll have a flying suit under that. that. Pair of Brilliant. 36 boots. Um, let's go with the Dope May West, because that's, that's yep. the real oh, one. Yeah. There we go. And we'll stick a flying helmet up there. And you would be lost without your scarf. Scarf. Let's it's get you changed. Stuff. Ready? Edit. Edit. Pilot Officer Tomes, reporting for duty. Hi, Jamie. How do I look? You're looking the part. You look ready for your first sortie. How even you... for, with the cigarette, he even looks more authentic. How do you feel about that? I feel, yeah, I feel, I feel confident. I feel very smart, very stylish, but I also feel very, very hot. I cannot believe they wore this much stuff. Well, that's nothing. If... Uh, Pilot Officer Hills wants to step in. You would have this uniform on underneath what you're wearing at the moment. You're this kidding is me. made of a wool barathea. Uh, it's built for warmth. Clothing in this period in Great Britain was built to keep you warm. Now, you know, you've got the shirt, the detachable collar, the tie. Yep. The guys flew wearing the shirt and tie the whole lot. You've got to remember, once you get to altitude, it gets colder. So they'd be wearing this outfit underneath the overalls, That's correct. which is about three layers down. Yep, you might have your woolen underwear on underneath. Then you've got your cotton poplin shirt and tie. Then the jacket. Oh, I thought you guys called them pants. Then you've got your underwear. cotton poplin shirt and tie. Then the jacket. Then yeah. your flying suit, prestige suit. Uh, the I'm jacket wearing pants top, right yeah. now. May West. And we've got the parachute, which we haven't even got to yet, but that's some more weight and that's going to keep some more heat in because it's going to be a little bit restricting. Well, we'll get to that bit later. Uh, let's start from the top. Um, I'm actually going to push this back because I can't actually hear you guys that well. 
Well, I'm guessing that was for a reason, wasn't it? You'd have some mic. There's mic sound equipment. deadening in there because obviously when you're flying, a Spitfire is a loud piece of equipment. Yeah. So that's in there to deaden the sound. So what you're getting is as much of the sound in your receivers yeah. as possible. And who would you be speaking to? You'd be speaking to your squadron leader? Or... It could be, depends. You'd be speaking to guys in your flight. You might be, depending on the role, speaking to the op. What's the point of uh, goggles if you're already enclosed in a cockpit? Maybe if, like, it shattered or something? As yeah. possible. You take, speak to guys in your flight, you might be, depending on the role, speaking to the ops room, um, just it. over okay. here at Duxford, or possibly Uxbridge, or another one of the ops rooms, yeah. And right here, if I just actually take this off, we have the uh, the oxygen mask. Now, That's would right. you need this at every single altitude or just when you're really high? No, when you're low, you don't need oxygen. Okay. So, you know, you obviously taken off, they're not wearing the oxygen mask, but it, it will always be attached to this side, ready to be fitted, ready to use the microphone or the oxygen, which plugs in into that nozzle here. there, okay? You've also got the goggles here yep, as that's well, right. Mark II flying goggles. Very uh, iconic. Very early pair. Um, yep, again, once you're, you know, possibly spotting the target that you're going to go for, that's the point where you're going to put the goggles on. Put the goggles on, yeah. okay. A lot of this is also to do with fire protection. The Irvin um, goggles, you've got to remember that sometimes there was fires. Yeah. A lot of the pilots were very, very scared of fires to the point where they would wear um, Sidcot suits or urban suits, as much stuff as possible pr to protect themselves. So if you've got your goggles on your mask, you're protecting more of yourself. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Guys, I gotta pee really bad. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, go. I wash my hands. So I've just taken the life jacket off. Uh, right, this is the iconic jacket, isn't it? It's the sort of... The urban suit jacket. Yep. Yeah. It's almost um, uh, the hallmark of the RAF pilot. Absolutely. Um, hugely popular throughout the war, um, worn by many air crews. Also popular post-war motorcyclists. Absolutely. Uh, other yeah. adventuring types. <laughs> uh, and you can see why. You don't want to take it off, do you? No. I d you well, want to go home in that jacket. I, d I do, but I also it's also very hot. And you yeah. said there were also, were there, you know, warmed versions of this? Yep, they had wired versions, wired um, versions. which had a heating element inside, matching trousers, uh, inserts, all the boots and also gloves so you could plug wow. into the aircraft keep yourself warm that way and underneath here huh? you've got trousers uh, inserts for the boots and also gloves so you could plug wow. into the aircraft keep yourself warm that way and underneath here we've got plug the overalls so this you said would be you'd wear this you have that on over the top of your black overalls wool uniform. Um, this is called a prestige suit. Uh, they were popular with motorists as well in the yep. 1930s. If you look at pictures of racing car drivers, a lot of them wear the white one I've got on. The black became more popular in the early war period, particularly um, there's one famous pilot called Dizzy Allen. He had a black suit and he said he bought a black suit because he thought it was more in keeping with the mood of the time in 1940. Got it, okay. They went out of, um, I'd say, fashion, but they, you don't see them much after the Battle of Britain uh, as, as more clothing and equipment became available. And last but not least, the boots. boots. 1936 pattern flying boots. Again, very warm. Just, I, it's the fur, it's so thick. Yep. Um, is there anything else that I'm forgetting? A parachute. Parachute, yes. On top of everything else. Is there an ejector seat? Can no. we try well, this on? Uh, oh, I mean, was there an ejector seat? Ben, is this? Uh... You certainly can. Would you like to try it on over everything, or how about just the May West for the for the let's, sake of this? Yeah, let's, I think so. Let's get your life jacket back on. I don't think I can bear nine or ten layers. <laughs> So this is the seat type parachute, sometimes referred to as the pilot's parachute, Yes. Uh, made by Irvin. Um, this would have been worn by Spitfire pilots, Hurricane pilots, anyone who's flying, anyone who's a pilot essentially. Um, so you see you've got the, this is called the quick release box. Uh, the idea is that you can hit this when you need to get out of your parachute. Maybe you're hanging up in a tree, maybe you're in the sea, okay. but you need to get out quickly because yeah. that parachute could be doing, you know, something in the wind, something in the water. So dragging you down. So, if you pull those two up, up. Wait a second. Okay. But you need to get out of this when you need to get out of your parachute. Maybe hang. Oh my god. I thought that was. I. 
I was list. I thought that was how you deployed the parachute. <laughs> Good thing I'm not listening for the first time because I would have jumped out and been like, <laughs> "Sorry, I I'm dumb." Okay. Hanging up in a tree, maybe you're in the sea, okay. but you need to get out quickly because yeah. that parachute could be doing, you know, something in the wind, something in the water. So dragging you down. So if you pull those two up, up. So is it, as if I'm in a cockpit right That's now. right. That's what we're imagining. This yeah. is going to come over the top. We've got those two. Yeah, I've got those two. There we go, and you're in. Oh. So if you want to stand up and feel okay. the weight. Oh, boy. I did not expect that at mm -hmm. all. So it's almost like part of the seat. Isn't yep, it? so the seat has a recess in it to in allow the for the seat pack to sit in. Wow. The seat's also adjustable in height, so you can move up and down depending on. You know, for takeoff, you'll be at the top, so you've got the best view. You've got yep. to remember, you're sitting like this, looking at the sky, right, because absolutely. the back of the aeroplane's on the ground, yep. and the front's like this, so you can wind the seat up, and then you're seeing a little bit more. And I, I'm just imagining having to eject, essentially, from, from, this, uh, from this aircraft. You'd have to, what's the process? Slide what's, the canopy slide back. Slide the canopy back. Sutton harness would have to come off from over the top of this. That's the one holding you into the seat. Seat, yeah. Then you've got to try and pull yourself out. And you <laughs> might be... <laughs> imagining having to eject, essentially, from, from, this, uh, from this aircraft. You'd have to, what's the process? Slide what's, the canopy slide back. Slide the canopy back. Sutton harness would have to come off from over the top of this. That's the one holding you into the seat. Seat, yeah. Then you've got to try and pull yourself out. And you might be diving, turning, you could be under some G's. Yep. Um, you could almost be pushed into the aircraft and you're going to have to physically pull yourself, pull yourself out. Outwards, yeah. And then you've got to get usually over the side and onto the I wing. Was say and, so. and then you have to be at a height. So for even for the parachute to work, to save you, you have to be, you know, your plane has to be incapacitated, you know, go in a condition where you would want to get out of it high enough in the air for you to realize your plane's going down, fight your way out of the plane with the G's and whatnot, get out, still be high enough, high up above the ground enough to deploy the parachute. And then I, I don't know how long it takes from deploying to a safe fall speed, but uh, I mean, if, if you're, in a dogfight, kind of close to the ground. So it's pulled it's, off oh, it's in the slipstream. onto the side with this dragging behind. That's right. It's just, oh, yeah, it doesn't and even bend. At the point you about. then pull this, you're hoping whoever's packed it has done a good job. Yeah. Because if it's not packed right, that's not going to open and you're no. brown bread. After speaking to Jamie, I wasn't so sure if being a Spitfire pilot really would have suited me. Guys, Suppose the the propeller i need to learn how does a propeller propel i wasn't so sure if being a spitfire pilot really would have suited me supposing i had made the call nonetheless what would my training look like luckily john romain owner of the aircraft restoration company and one of the pilots flying at the Duxford Air Show was on hand to talk me through it. Now, a couple of uh, my family members flew Spitfires during the Second World War, but I never got the chance to ask them what the process of training was like. Now, there's perhaps no better person to ask than yourself. Take me through that training uh, process. We're next to, yeah. what is this here? This is, this one is of... a, a Spitfire 11. Okay. Um, and as you can see, it has a tail wheel. So it's sitting on the ground in a three-point attitude, yep. which means that the, from the cockpit, you can see very little straight forward. Okay. So that comes heavily into the training. So we pick pilots who have got tail wheel experience. They may have trained on tiger moths, as they did during the Second World War, um, or chipmunks in, the, in today's age. And then we put them into a T6 Harvard, which is still a tail wheel aeroplane, but much more powerful. Yep. has retracting undercarriage, I think the variable position propellers and things like that. That brings them up to the next level. Guys, I, I know I'm going out on a limb here, but I've had some interesting people react before and interested. Just, does anyone know anyone or a grandfather or something that flew maybe one of these who knew someone who flew World War I planes? Because I'd imagine in World War I, I'd be much more terrified because the 
I would think the plane technology in World War II, even though it's only 20 years later, would still be much more safe. I I'm just wondering, like, what were your chances of not making it in a World War I plane compared to a World War II plane? Still a tail wheel aeroplane, sense? but much more powerful. Yeah. It has retracting undercarriage. I think the variable position propellers and things like that. That brings them up to the next level, and from then we put them into a two-seat Spitfire. Got it. And of course, okay. during the war, they weren't available no. as two-seaters, but they are now. So we train them in the two-seat Spitfires, and then eventually they go into the single seats. Got it. And let's talk a bit about the Spitfire itself. Um, it's a, such a unique sounding uh, yeah. aircraft. Why has it remained the, the darling of the British media and the public and is still one of the most famous aircraft of all time? I think it's a mixture. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, just looking at the aeroplane, it looks right, doesn't it? I yeah, mean, a, a just look at it. really does look um, a very you know, streamlined, pretty, yeah. whatever you want to describe it as, but it's a good looking aeroplane. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, it, it fell in, people fell in love with the Spitfire um, because of that, because of the fact that it was a very successful fighter. Yeah. Um, and it sounds great. I mean, the, the Merlin engine yep. sounds Iconic, fantastic. Of course. So yep. you mix the sight like and the sound car. together and people just adore Spitfires. Am I correct in saying that the Spitfire was what, the only British aircraft that from the start 1939 and lasted all the way up until 1945? I know you mentioned that they had to add weapons to it and, and change it up, but... Yeah, it went right through the war with de development all the time. So, of course, we started with the Mark 1s yeah. and we ended up with Mark 19s. So, yeah. and, uh, okay, so all in between there is a lot of different aeroplanes, but they were all developed um, to suit a need during the war. So increasing speed, increasing armaments, all sorts of different things they were used for. So John, we're next to it. So the exhaust is coming out of those things. So if you're kind of going at a, just the right angle downward, I mean, I suppose you'd have the, your windshield because then it would be blowing in your face, but it, it, things that we used for. So John, we're next to a, a Spitfire here. Can you yeah. tell me a bit about the, some of the uh, uh, unique attributes of this aircraft? Okay, well, this one is uh, a Mark 9. Uh, it was a single-seat Mark 9, now it's a two-seat Mark 9. Okay. And the Mark 9s had four-blade propellers. The earlier Marks were... Right, okay. They started off originally with a simple two-blade, then they went to three-blade, then to f four, eventually to five with the Griffin. I, I had to fix something. And now it's a two-seat Mark 9. Okay. And the Mark 9s had four-blade propellers. The earlier Marks were... Right, okay. They started off originally with a simple two-blade, then they went to three-blade, then to f four, eventually to five with the Griffin engine. Got so it, okay. the development of more and more horsepower needed bigger propellers, basically. Absolutely. So this is a four-blade. Um, the blades on them, interestingly, are actually made of a wood substance. So they're oh, not yeah. metal, they're actually wood. And, Is that um, unique to the Spitfire? Uh, pretty much. Some of the other fighters had them, um, but most, you know, if you looked at an American fighter, for instance, they'd be metal. Metal, okay. But uh, the Spitfire always had... Almost looks like fiberglass. It looks so smooth. Wooden blades. And we come over to the... Uh, uh, the Spitfire. These are cannons here, right? Or would they be Browning yeah. machine guns? No, these are cannons. So these are 20 millimeter cannons. Again, that was something that the Mark 9 carried. Um, I wonder if if the spread of the two because obviously the the two machine guns are about what seven meters apart or something like that eight nine meters apart so like would it be so accurate that they would have to actually like pick a gun to you know what i mean because you have uh two guns like to pick a gun to ah to aim or was it just like you, you couldn't aim that well kind of like with anti-aircraft guns you ever notice anti-aircraft guns like in world war ii there or even modern day that, like there's always two or even four barrels to kind of just get and so i wonder if it's the same strategy here or if they were actually so accurate that they had to like pick a wing and then do you know 20 millimeter cannons again that was something that the mark 9 carried 
Um, the Mark V's also had uh, 20 millimeter cannons, but they had a mixture, so they would, different wings on a Spitfire dictated what the armament was. So some Got had it. cannons, some had cannons and machine guns. So there was a variation of it. Is it true that they had about 15 seconds worth of, of ammunition? Yeah, they didn't have long. So the idea was that they would just do one or two second bursts. Spurt, right. yeah. If you just held your finger on the button, you'd get rid of your ammunition incredibly quickly. Seven seconds, wow. Yeah. Is, and is that just because they couldn't carry that much ammunition, especially yeah, with this Yeah, I mean, it, if you look hit? at the wing, it's very slim. Yeah. Uh, which helps, of course, with the speed. But not so much with but the But it didn't help so much. Did I miss, did he say where the fuel tank was and I missed it? Because I know, like, modern airliners, passenger, the, the fuel is in the wings. And you're trying, uh, which helps, of course, with the speed. But not so much with but the But it didn't help so much when you're trying to put ammunition yeah. in there. And or fuel. And, of course, the, the Spitfire did not have a, a real great range. So one hour, 40 minutes was about the maximum you were going to okay. get out of a Spitfire. Because there was nowhere to put the fuel. Um, the fuel is actually carried in the fuselage. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Not in the wings. And if we come round here to the cockpit. I heard that. Just... Very famous bubble uh, Yeah, the bubble canopy. canopy. Yeah. Um, and the side hinging door. Um, again, pretty unique to a Spitfire. Yeah. Um, and inside there, of course, you can see the, the control column. Two pounds, three pounds, four pounds. Instrumentation. The un undercarriage selecting unit. Um, and the, the front screen there, that big piece, is the armoured glass. So the, gradually again through the development, they started to fit armour to them. Um, so you'd have big pieces of steel plate behind the pilot to protect him. Got it. Some under Armoured glass. I figure... So you know how, like, if you're in a car and you just, like, drop... If you're going 70 miles an hour in a car and you just drop a tennis ball out the car and the tennis ball hits someone, it's going to hit someone at 70 miles an hour if it hits them directly after, you know? And so if, if, if you're getting hit in the front, that means that a plane is shooting coming at you. So that's the speed of the plane coming at you, the speed of you going towards the plane, and then the speed of the bullet from the plane I'd imagine high caliber rounds like it's it, and that could stop it because I mean what uh, what other type of fire are you going to be protecting yourself from and so if that glass can stop a bullet that's going however fast that that's crazy have big pieces of steel plate behind the pilot to protect him got it some underneath the seat You'd have armoured glass in the front there, obviously, to protect him from anything coming towards him. Um, and then in various places in the wings, they fitted armour plate, for instance, behind the ammunition trays, so that if the aircraft was hit by a shell that went into the ammunition areas, the ammunition wasn't Wouldn't set off. Wouldn't blow up. Yeah, yeah that's the real because, danger, isn't it? Yeah, that all added weight. And so, you know, steel plate, you know, a good quarter of an inch thick gets heavy. Yeah, and, and it so, can take take speed off really quickly, exactly. can't it? Yeah. And um, talking about speed, I believe uh, the Japanese Zeros were, or I don't know what kind of airplane, were extremely lightweight, and that was always a problem for Americans. Like if, if you hit if you hit the plane, it was very fragile, but it was extremely maneuverable, and they had super good pilots. Um, the Anyone part who knows more about World War Two. Japanese airplanes, um, please correct me. Pilots who had to, as soon as they heard the alarm go off, the siren, how quickly did they have to get into these Spitfires and take off? 
well, as quick as possible, basically. But the, the aircraft, was, they were always warm. So the ground crews kept the air, the engines warm okay, and ready. Just in case. And yeah. then topped the fuel up all the time. So by the time that bell did go, the pilot literally ran to the aeroplane, Step jumped on the gas. in, started and was gone. They could take off And so the only thing he really, some of them even, you know, were still strapping their parachute harnesses on as they were taxiing out because oh, wow. they would just had to get airborne as soon as they could. It's like me every time I pull out of the... Never mind, I can't... At the time of the air show, I was understandably unable to get inside the cockpit of the famous aircraft. But a certain Mr. Dan Snow had... Danny. ...the opportunity to fly in a Spitfire Legend. a few years ago. You can watch that documentary on History Hit TV. But anyway, back to the Battle of Britain air show at Duxford where a crew of pilots, including John, were about to give a very special display in honor of Her Majesty the Queen. Rest in peace, Queen Liz. So good. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel. Hope you enjoyed that video. And if you'd like to see more videos where we attempt to try and bring history to life, uh, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Cheers, guys. Rare World War II weapons. Um, awesome. History Hit. I remember when they just like started channel. They they clearly had their stuff together. It wasn't like a new channel. Oh, let's see. Like they had a lot of stuff behind them. But I remember when they were at like 15k subs, shot up, well deserved. Awesome video. Um, hope I didn't pause or annoy you too much there. Love if you guys could answer some of my questions. Hope you learned something or, or again can teach me something. And I hope you're all doing well. If you are not doing well, don't worry my friend, chin up. Emotions are fickle. You'll be good soon, trust me. Bye guys.